Hello and welcome to MC4 at Home. We are delighted to have you. My name is Chris. I serve here as the lead pastor. And to our church family and the many who've been following us here online during the COVID-19 season, welcome back to our guests. Those who may be here for a first time, welcome. You are wanted by Jesus. You are deeply loved in him. And we are thankful that we get the opportunity to consider his ways and his word with you today. So a few things I want to walk you through that are normal for us and hopefully will help you. First is, please go to the landing page on our website or into our app and look at the opportunity to fill out a connect card. This is our way of communicating with each other, especially when you're newer. It allows us the opportunity to reach out to you and just say thank you for your time and your trust and to potentially engage with you towards a connection. We want that. And if that's the desire of your heart, fill out that Connect card. Also, we want to be praying with you this week, so there's a dedicated spot for you to fill out a prayer request. Please allow us to stand with you in faith, believing God for his work in your world and life. And then also, we want to invite you into the opportunity to continue your worship of giving. Thank you for your faithfulness in this. And so here online, we have a platform or a portal for giving. A, a note about that. We have changed our platform. We've gone to a system called PushPay, and this is a wonderful system that makes everything easier in terms of giving. In fact, now you can give just through a text. So do this for us, would you? Text MC4S to 77977, and you will directly be sent a link to give. This is our new system. It's going to be very helpful for us. We're excited about it, and we're thankful for your ongoing faithfulness. Should you have any questions, please email John at mc4s.org. Let's prepare our hearts to respond to God in worship. Today we have the opportunity to receive communion together. In fact, if you need to pause the video and prepare the elements, the cracker and the cup, please go ahead and do so now. But as we prepare our hearts to receive of communion, we enter into responsiveness with God. This is the God who loves you, who in Jesus gave himself for you. Let's give ourselves to him today in worship. Good morning, church family. Welcome. It's good to be worshiping with you this morning in your homes. This morning we get to come to the communion table together. And as we uh, will do that, Pastor Chris will come up right after worship and lead us in a time of communion. But I would love to call us to worship this morning with our communion creed. So the words will be at the bottom of your screen. And would you read this and profess this aloud with me this morning? Our time of communion is a celebration of memory and hope. Through it, we proclaim Jesus' real presence with us, the forgiveness offered to us through Christ's work on the cross, and the ongoing spiritual nourishment he provides us. We come to this communion table with gratitude, recognizing that it is a complete gift of grace rather than something we have earned through our own achievement. We acknowledge that the power in communion does not come from the bread and the cup, but from the Holy Spirit, who unites us with Christ through the celebration. And while this act of remembrance is deeply personal, we celebrate it as the gathered community of believers in love and in concern for one another. We come in hope, believing that this bread and cup are a pledge and a foretaste of the feast that is to come when his kingdom is fully revealed and with unveiled faces, we shall behold him and reflect his glory. Amen. And let's worship together. Thank you. 
thank you for the cross that you have carried. Thank you for your blood that was shed. Took the weight of sin upon your shoulders. Sacrificed your life so I could live. Now nothing is holding back from you, Redeemer of my soul. Now nothing can hold me back from you. Your love will never let me go. Thank you for your death and resurrection. And I am overwhelmed by your affection, the kindness and the greatness of your love, the kindness and the greatness of your love. Thank you that we're living in your kingdom. Jesus, you're the king upon the throne. Thank you for the way you always loved me. Now I get to love you and return. Now I get to love you. we come to the communion table this morning, let's just bring Jesus thanksgiving for everything that he's done. Just begin to confess, God, this is what you've done for me, and I thank you for it. We bless your name, Jesus. Open up the doors again Let the King of glory in His kingdom will never end Oh, I know that you are good Break the darkness with your light All the earth let praise arise Any dead place come alive Oh, I know that you are good. Oh, I know that you are good. You will end my hallelujah. You alone, the highest name. All to you, 
Today, as we receive communion, we receive the intentional work of Jesus for each of us. He too is giving us the bread for his body. 
He too is giving us the cup for his blood. Body and blood, broken and shed for each of us. You are greatly loved in God. Let that settle in. You can't evade it. You can't get away from it. You can object to it, but you can't contradict it. You are greatly loved in God. He desires that all would come to repentance. And the work of his son on the cross is so comprehensive that me, a kid who grew up in kind of out of the way Idaho, Pastor Sherry who grew up in more out of the way Idaho, he found us. Just like he finds people in South Africa or on the island of Guam. You are greatly loved in God, pursued and wanted. And would you again allow the declaration of his death? For that is what the Lord told us, that every time you receive of this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. He's coming back for us. He's coming back to finish the fullness of what this represents. But until then, we are to be a people marked by the God who loves so much that he gave his son. We are the beloved community. As Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, he said, take and eat. Would you take and eat? We receive God of love so grand so high and deep so wide and long that we cannot fathom it in its fullness we receive now of love that would give everything Nothing held back from us. We receive, Lord. Thank you for your broken body. Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness and your courage to face what left to ourselves we would never have the courage to face. And blessing the cup, proclaiming it as that which marks the blood of the new covenant the very forgiveness of our sin through our faith in Jesus, which you take and drink. Brings a smile to my face, Lord. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Psalm 103 says that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed your sin, our sin, excuse me, from us. Oh God, you, you treat us according to your son, not according to our sin. <laughs> Thank you. We receive of your care today. We are secure in your hand. We are secure in all things. Your kingdom cannot be shaken. Your love for us cannot be broken. Can anything separate us from the love of God that is revealed to us in Christ Jesus? No, no, nothing in all creation. So thank you, Father. May our lives, may our lives today and this week be a response to what you've done for us on the cross. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Would you open up the very word of God to us as we study your scriptures? Would you, Spirit, be poured out upon us and renew our minds? God, would you cause us to live your way in the middle of this broken planet? We love you. Amen. 
Please turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 12 as we continue our teaching series, We Bless, a summer study in the book of Genesis. We've already spent two weeks in this study where we were creating a foundational understanding of blessing within the book of Genesis. So let's quickly review where we've been in order to get to where we want to go today. In short order, blessing is a predominant theme in the first book of our scriptures. It's the Hebrew word barach, and it's used 73 times in the book of Genesis. Through its uses, we see very clearly that God is always the source of blessing towards humanity. Whatever we may do to participate in his blessing or to extend it, one thing is radiantly clear. All blessing flows from God. All blessing. That over 300-year-old hymn known as the doxology, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. It's right. It's good theology. All blessing flows from God. It is his domain to bless. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we read of God creating and delighting in his good creation, the work of his heart and hands. Humans are described as being made in the image of God, the very crown jewel of his created order. Genesis 1 verse 28 explicitly declares that God blessed his image bearers and invited them into partnership of stewardship in the earth. God gave himself to his beloved. His relational presence was fully theirs, and he invited them with him to steward creation. Then Genesis 3 introduced us to the very first occurrence of a curse in Scripture. The construct of now blessing and cursing running throughout the narrative of Scripture but especially in the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures. The curse of sin introduced tremendous change into our lives, relationally with God, relationally with one another. And because of the curse, we deal with its consequences literally every minute of every day, resulting in a lived-in experience of the inherent tension this good creation now experiences because of rebellion and its consequences. So this is where we've been these last few weeks, and today we want to study a teaching entitled Blessed to be a Blessing, which is the language of our whole series. But today in Genesis chapter 12, we're literally going to read this statement that essentially Abram was blessed to be a blessing. We want to understand this. We want to know what it meant for him and what it means for us. We've been using this metaphor to help us with an understanding of this construct, blessed to be a blessing, that we are called to be rivers of blessing, if you will, not reservoirs of blessing. A reservoir pools up resource. A reservoir builds up, hoards, keeps but a river is that which flows from one place to another, bringing life along with it. So not reservoirs, but rivers. Blessed to be a blessing. As we land in Genesis chapter 12, it's helpful to summarize the tremendous content within the first 11 chapters of Genesis. While we've studied specifically out of Genesis 1 and 3 thus far, what's What's the first 11 chapters telling us about? In order to summarize that, to give us good understanding of where we land in Genesis 12, let's watch the Bible Project's video on Genesis 1 through 11. It's about five and a half minutes long, well worth our time. Let's watch. The first book in the Bible is a book you've probably heard of. It's called Genesis. Genesis comes from a Hebrew word. Uh, it's pronounced reshit, uh, and it just means beginning. Now, there's a lot of stories from the book of Genesis, and it's easy just to pull out a specific story and, and try to tell you what it might mean. But we think the best way to understand this book is to look at the book as a whole and show you how the whole thing is designed. The book is designed to fall into two main parts. 
You have uh, chapters 1 through 11, which is telling the story of God and the whole world. And then you have the second part, which is about God and Abraham's family, as chapters 12 through 50. And how the two of those parts relate, that's where you find the message of the book. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. The first part of Genesis begins with a creation story, where God creates everything. And how exactly that happens, of course, that's where all the debates come. But he takes a dark, watery chaos, and he turns it into a beautiful garden where humans can can flourish. That sounds nice. It does sound nice. In fact, seven different times God says of all that he's made that it's good. And this is where we meet the first human characters in the Bible, Adam and Eve. They're, they're both individual characters, but they're also representative. Adam is the Hebrew word for humanity, and Eve is the Hebrew word for life. And God creates them in his image. In other words, humanity reflects or is meant to reflect the the, the creativity, the goodness and character of the creator out into the world that he's made. And they're supposed to reproduce and make cultures and neighborhoods and art and gardens and and everything else. But he gives them a, a moral choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And this is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. And he tells them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree or you will die. What's that all about? So up till now, God has been the one defining and providing what is good. And so God is the one with the knowledge of good and evil. But now this tree represents a choice. Will the humans trust God's definition of good and evil, or are they going to seize the opportunity and define good and evil for themselves? And Adam and Eve eat the fruit. This is the core biblical explanation for that concept of sin, that desire to call the shots myself. It's the inward turn of the human heart to do what's good for me and my tribe, even if it's at the expense of you and and your tribe. And the problem is humans are horrible at defining good and evil without God. And so now that humanity's made this choice, things get really, really, they're really bad. So Genesis 3 through 11 is like tracing this downward spiral of all, all humanity. So Adam and Eve, they can't trust each other anymore. And so there's a little story about how they were naked and felt fine about it beforehand, but now they feel shameful because all of a sudden Adam's definition of good and evil might be different than Eve's. And so they hide from each other. Then there's another story of temptation. Cain is jealous of his brother Abel, and he gives in and kills him. There's a story right after Cain about a guy named Lamech, and all we know about Lamech is that he accumulates wives like property, and he sings songs about how he's a more violent, vengeful person than Cain ever was, and he's proud of it. Things get so bad with the human race that we see God decide to just wipe us out. Yeah, we typically think of the flood story It's about God being angry, but it actually begins with God's sadness and grief about the state of his world. And so out of his passion to preserve the goodness of his world, he washes it clean with the flood. But there's a glimmer of hope. He he chooses Noah and his whole family, and he saves them on this boat. Don't forget about the animals. Right, and the animals. So Noah and his family are going to reboot all of humanity. I mean, he must be a pretty great guy. But this is the story most people don't know because it's kind of weird is that Noah gets off the boat and he plants a vineyard and he gets totally plastered and then something sketchy happens in his tent with his son. It's a tragic story. So from here humanity grows again but things are as bad as before and the last story is the famous story of the Tower of Babel. And in this story you have all of the nations uniting together to use this new technology they have, the brick. And they want to make a name for themselves and build this big city with a huge tower that will reach up to the gods. But God knows that this city will be a nightmare. And so in his mercy, he scatters them. And all of these stories, they're underlining the same basic idea. When humans seize autonomy from God, when they define good and evil for themselves, it results in a world of tragedy and death. And this leaves you wondering, Is there any hope for humanity? Yes, yeah, there is. It's the very next story that answers that question. It's the beginning of God's mission to rescue and restore his world. 
as we move from the storytelling in the first 11 chapters now into God's choice of and way with a particular family, several quick contextual points are helpful. The author of Genesis provides an intentional juxtaposition. That is a comparison and contrast of Babel in Genesis 11 and Abram or Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Where the people of Babel in Genesis 11 decided to make a name for themselves as verse 4 reads, we're about to read of Abram who lets God make a name for him. Two very different ways in the earth. It's also worth us stopping to note that Babel in Hebrew means Babylon. If you're familiar with the whole story of Scripture, you realize that Babylon becomes a tremendously important player in the narrative. Babylon runs throughout the story. Of course, in a physical or a literal manifestation, the nation of Babylon. But we also see Babylon as a metaphor for the world's systems. It's later in the New Testament that the apostles Peter and John actually speak of Babylon to reference the world power at the time, Rome, and its opposition, the way in which it manifests in opposition to the way and rule of Jesus Christ. In fact, John very emphatically describes in the book of Revelation 18 the call from heaven, the call of an angelic being to the people of God, which says, people of God, come out of Babylon, run out of Babylon, that you would not share in her sin and the consequences that are to follow. So we see that Babylon, here's what I'm, I'm really after. Why am I telling you all of this? What's happening here in Genesis 11 and 12 is really important for the rest of the biblical story. It's so epic, it's so important. And what we see even here in Babylon and then in Abram and all that follows through his line is that there's two ways in the earth. One in which we do as we see fit, making a name for ourselves, or a way in which we allow God to do as he sees fit, in which his heart is stirred towards us, and he moves towards us, and if you will, he's the one who makes a name through us for himself. So two ways in the earth, and it's thread throughout the whole of Scripture, even at the conclusion of Revelation, there it is. It's also meaningful to note that the narrative suddenly slows down here in Genesis 12. Listen to scholar Stephen Dempster's description. He writes, the previous millennia can be described in 11 chapters, Genesis 1 through 11. The next 25 years occupy 10 chapters. In the narrative world, it's as if the world has been waiting for this moment, the arrival of Abram. So let's get to our text of study today. We're in Genesis 12. We're going to study verses 1 through 7. We'll make some observations on the way and then get to some points of application. So Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. The Lord tells Abram to leave his country, which begs the question, where was his country? At the end of chapter 11, we read of Abram's father, Terah, taking his family from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran. Ur is located in present-day Iraq and Haran in eastern Turkey. Notice two things in this very brief statement, two big things. First, Abram is told by the Lord to go. Abram, you need to go. You need to leave. And you will be leaving to the land I will show you. I'm not showing you yet, but as you go somewhere along the way, I will show you. 
This sentence is short and to the point, and yet it's absolutely seismic in terms of its requirement of Abram. Now, notice the Lord, he's going to prove here in this text very gracious. Think with me for a moment on this, that that the culture in which the Lord appears to Abram or draws near to Abram, that culture is polytheistic. Abram in all likelihood did not know the Lord and was a worshiper of multiple deities at one point in his life, very likely even at the point that God initiates with him. Remember that throughout scripture, God is the one who initiates with his people. God's the one who's come after us and the story of Abram is no different. God came after Abram. God came to Abram and he spoke to him, leave the country that you know, the security therein, leave your family, leave everything you've known and walk into the unknown to the land I will show you. Wow. God clearly has plans to address humanity and to bring rescue, but Abram Abram doesn't know the fullness of any of what is ahead. Abram can't have our perspective that the fullness of Scripture gives us. What that means is that God's call here required Abram to exercise tremendous faith. There's a divine partnership. And blessing runs on these lines. God initiates, God's the source. And yet, as he's the source, then there's this partnership in his presence, in his blessing. God's call here required Abraham to exercise tremendous faith. Let's let's get to verse two. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So this is clearly poetry and it's repetitious in its nature. We're gonna read verse three, which is the very same way here shortly. But for verse two, remember this, that the people of Babel had already attempted to make a name for themselves. We are going to make a name for us. We're going to achieve greatness, if you will. We're going to do life on our own terms, on our own way, and we are going to get there without the aid of our creator. As one scholar put it, humanity had insisted on seeking meaning on its own by questing for a name by itself. But here, God makes a bold announcement that he would freely give a name to Abram. God's rescue of humanity would not be by human achievement that came by Abram's work. But ultimately, it would result as a gift of God's free grace (laughs) accessible through faith. And again, I want you to see here something that runs all throughout Scripture. God's gracious way. We see grace. Notice the language. I will bless you. And you will be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. Let's get to verse 3. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is a remarkable statement. I will bless those who bless you. God essentially says that his relationship to others will in part be determined by the relationship of these others to Abram. How they interact with and ultimately choose to either bless or curse Abram will result in God's way towards them. Oh, this is a game changer. The final statement here in this proclamation, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, is this, all eventually, all of the earth's clans and people groups in the end will be blessed through Abram. So in this Short Hebrew poem, we see this. God saying, I will bless you and you will become a blessing. And then I'm going to be with you in a way where those those who react to you, Abram, those who relate to you in a way that ultimately results in blessing, my blessing will be upon them. And those who react to you in a way that diminishes you, that harms you, my blessing will not be upon them. Right, So God's relational way being made manifest in the earth very specifically at this moment with and through Abram. 
But then he says this. He ultimately says this. That where this is all going, this is, I am going to ultimately bless every human clan on the planet through you. And remember the context in which this comes. We're immediately on the heels of Babel, the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, where ultimately because of man's arrogance, pride, and wickedness, God decided to disperse people. The table of nations, it was created. Right? So there's disbursement. But notice in the disbursement, God's heart running through it. I will not leave one clan. I will not leave one people group. I will not leave one entity that has been dispersed out of my purpose and out of my plan. All human clans. Yes, I have done this. Yes, I have, I have dispersed. But even in the midst of that, I have a plan to reveal myself. And I'm starting with one man that will then result in a family, that then res- result in a nation, that then will result in a savior, that then will result in a people of God, Jew and Gentile, and I will make myself known. My rescue will be made known in the midst of the nations. It's, it's beautiful. What God's doing here with Abram is, beautiful let's get to verse 4 so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran Abram's faith leads him to obedience and suffice it just to say that a good point of observation for every one of us is this that our engagement with God our receiving of blessing, his relational presence in our lives, our engagement in faith will always lead us as it did Abram. We won't necessarily be called to a land, I will show you. But we're always going to be dealing with unknowns and uncertainties. COVID-19 has introduced all sorts of gripping realities around us for us. And we will be called to engage our faith with obedience to the revealed ways of God in the person of Jesus. Obedience, obedience. I wonder how is the Holy Spirit challenging us to embrace obedience in this moment? Okay, verse five. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. I know you feel it. A map is coming on. Let's go ahead and move over to the television here so that I can show you the course that Abram's family and then Abram himself took. So we read earlier that Abram's father took the family from Ur of the Chaldeans and traveled up to Haran. Now, the text in Genesis 11 actually tells us that Terah, Abram's father, intended to actually make his way down to the land of the Canaanites. But he didn't end up getting there. He travels here with his family, and for whatever reason, he lands in Haran and he stays there. Maybe it was his health, because we learn shortly after landing there, that he passes. Whatever the case, they get to Haran. So when God calls Abram, the call then is to go to a land I will show you. And so Abram sets out, and he sets out on his father's journey. Isn't that powerful? There is, there is so much there for us to unpack. He sets out on his father's journey. So he, le- he leaves Haran, And he makes his way down. And ultimately, the text tells us that he lands in Shechem, the great tree of Morah in Shechem. So Abram and his clan, they were nomadic. And they were people who lived in tents. They intentionally, it would seem, stayed out of the hubs of cities, whatever cities looked like at the time. So they were on the edge of Shechem. And it was identified the great tree at Morah, the oak of Morah. Now, mora in Hebrew means vision. And why? Why is it called this? Well, good question. 
verse 7 tells us. Let's read that now. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land, the great tree of Morah. Why? Because God appeared there. And he said, To your offspring I will give this land. Several things happening here. Did you notice the word offspring? Maybe you remember last week. This is the Hebrew word zerah. I brought it to your attention because it runs throughout Genesis as well. Barak, blessing, 73 times. Zerah, 59 times. Offspring. That God was going to do something. There, while there was enmity between the offspring of humanity and the serpent, God was going to do something through the generations, the offspring. So this word is, has tremendous meaning. To your generations, this is what he says to Abram, to your generations, I will give this land. And remember where it started. Abram, let's go back over here. Abram, I'm calling you to go to a land I will show you. The journey, it's a long one, but he lands here. I will give you this land. I will give you the land that would, of course, become known as Israel. Israel. God was clearly going to do something for Abram here in this land and hit the generations that would follow him. Abram would not be able to make a name for himself. Did you notice that the text made mention of this, that the Canaanites were still in the land? Abram did not have the power in and of himself. He didn't. God would have to do this. Only God could do it. All right, let's look at three points of application having investigated this text. Blessed to be a blessing. What's some observations and applications we can make? Number one, we don't get blessing by making ourselves great. But in God, making us of resource to others. I know that's a mouthful, but let me say it again. We don't get blessing by making ourselves great, but in God, making us of resource to others to others. The opening of the Abraham story is set directly after and attached to the Babel story, where humanity was determined to make their own way without God. God was finding a way to chase after humanity through a man who would have a family. And through that family, the world would eventually be blessed. Through that family, the very Son of God would emerge. We don't, friends, we don't get God on our terms. I mean, if the Abram story settles us in anything in, from, from the beginning of it, we don't get God on our terms. God doesn't fit like a nice little piece of the puzzle in our story. No, we're the ones in his story, but we're also the ones that we've, we've been created in his image. We are the crown jewel of his created order. We are... As one of the Hebrew prophets says of Israel, God's way with Israel, we are the very apple of his eye, tender, dear, near, beloved. We, but we don't get God on our terms. We get him, if you will, on his. And ultimately, that's good news because we've seen the outworkings of doing what is right in our own eyes. We, we've seen how that works out. God's presence and way is so much better than our, our way without him. It's so much better than our way without him. And notice what's embedded within God's blessing of Abram. The making of Abram's name as great, it, it wasn't for Abram alone. From the first statement of blessedness, it's that Abram would then become a blessing. In Jesus, we become something we'd never be without him. A resource of God's heart and ways, his presence in our lives, his presence coming with us into the lives of others. In this way, to bless others is ultimately to live on mission with Jesus. We talk a lot about our mission as a local church, to be on mission with Jesus. That is to say, we get to extend the blessing of his presence. We get to extend the blessing of the gospel of Jesus, that in him, God is reconciling the world to himself. We get to extend the gospel to our family, neighborhood, workplace, and world. We are blessed to be a blessing, and we do not get blessing by making ourselves great, but in God making us a resource to others. 
Blessed to be a blessing. Secondly, Abram wasn't a good candidate to bring blessing to the world. Listen again to scholar Stephen Dempster. After the arrival of Abram on the scene, a new genealogical formula begins a narrative devoted to this man named Abram, who is described as such an inauspicious bearer of promise. His brother dies, his wife is barren, and as far as the ancient world is concerned, he's a no-name whose father dies shortly after making a migration from Ur to Haran with his family. What a pathetic sight is this man, trudging the dusty Mesopotamian roads, whose journey has come to a dead end northeast of Canaan. How could it be possible that one without such promise could hold so much promise? How is that possible? Abram changed the world, or better said, God changed the world through Abram. And what an unqualified candidate to accomplish God's purposes, Abram was. Which, according to the heart and mind of God, made manifest in his son and in his word, made Abram a perfect candidate for God to use him. This is the paradox, or one of the paradoxes within the kingdom of heaven. That when you are the least likely to be used of God, you probably are the most likely. That when you think you are completely unqualified, God says, perfect. That's exactly what I'm looking for. This trait or quality is not only true of Abram, but it is completely true of his descendants, Israel. They were never a big people or country within the table of nations. They were always facing one threat or another, and yet here 4,000 years later, Israel remains a blessing to the world in so many ways. May we all remember that when we think ourselves the least likely candidate to make God's heart and ways known, we're well positioned for him to use us for the benefit of, of another. Some 2,000 years after Abram, Paul reminded his readers of this in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 30. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. The Lord showed up to Abram and even here Paul saying to the Corinthians, the Lord showed up to you. You didn't find him, he found you. It's because of him that you are now in his son. He found you. It's when I get low that God can do something with me. It's when my heart gets low. And, uh, you know, COVID-19 has brought many of us low, discouraged. But I think, I, I wonder if God's doing something now where the discouragement is morphing into something else, a humility of heart, a lowness of heart, a positioning of God within us, God positioning us, and I wonder what will follow. When the people of God get low, God does something with people who are low of heart. He he lifts up. I read in Isaiah 57 this morning in my devotions, the Lord said, for I'm the one who lives in a high and holy place, but I also dwell with those who are contrite of heart and low of spirit, that I might revive those who are contrite and those low of spirit. Revive. Something's coming post-COVID-19. God's doing something. Let us not lose sight of that as we have to, to persevere 
through these days. Blessed to be a blessing. We don't get blessing by making ourselves great, but in God making us of resource to others. God gets to be the one who makes us great in his way and his kingdom. Blessed to be a blessing. Abram wasn't a good candidate to bring blessing to the world. Might I submit that neither of us are either? And yet here we are. And we have been blessed with the very relational presence of God to be a blessing to others. And thirdly, blessing comes with a responsibility and accountability. God's declaration of blessedness for Abram invited him into response, required faith of him. We too in Jesus are declared blessed. And, and, and remember the, the sharpness of the definition of what it means that we are blessed. The blessing of God is his relational presence in one's life and all that encompasses. We are those who are now marked in and by the presence of God. Those invited to come boldly before the very throne of God to receive mercy in our time of need. We have access to God ever and always. And as those who have access to God, it is then our privilege and opportunity to make the presence, the accessibility of God, relationally manifest with others. This is our privilege and opportunity, and from it flows our responsibility and accountability. Remember, we're rivers. We're not reservoirs. We're rivers. Now, this could sound weighty. And let's admit, uh, God doing what God's going to do in the midst of the earth, that is weighty. It's consequential. So may a holy awe, a fear of the Lord rest upon us. But lest we, we feel this weight wrongly, lest we think we have to carry it on our own, don't ever forget the way in which we've been invited into the life of of God, into life with God, and the carrying of his presence and ways in the earth. One of my favorite places in all of scripture, a place I go to time and time and time again, because my own heart needs the reminder time and time again. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, come to me, Jesus said, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Yoke simply understood is, is the idea of an authority, right? We, we, we take it from this construct of ox, the oxen that are, are under a yoke, this harness that allows these powerful creatures to pull together to move something behind them, move something substantial. It's this idea of of an authority. The, the ancient rabbis talked about the yoke of their teaching. So their teaching was a yoke. It was to come under this authority, to harness one's life, to point one's life in a direction. So here Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. Take my presence and my way, my teachings, my life. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn of my heart and my ways, for I am ultimately gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my authority, my teaching, my way, it's real. You are called into it. Forsake other yokes, get rid of other yokes, break off every other yoke, and take my yoke upon you. But as you do so, remember, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I will not forget the evening that early in our marriage, Jennifer and I are approaching 24 years of marriage, so this was a long time ago. But I will never forget the evening early in our marriage that we returned from an evening of, of ministry, engagement with the church. And we were busy. We were finishing up our our years in college, we were doing ministry, there was homework. Now, it was pre-kids. I still wonder how I thought life was difficult pre-kids, but you, underst you understand what I'm meaning, don't you? We were tired on this particular evening. We were getting home late. We drove home in our 1978 Toyota Celica that once was black, now was largely gray, somewhat rusting. 
but I remember we parked in our assigned parking spot in our apartment complex. And, and before we got out of the car, we had a conversation around this concept. And I remember telling Jennifer something like this. I thought Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If that's true, then why does life feel so heavy right now? I had a lot of learning to do. I've had a lot of learning to do. I still have so much learning of the life and way of Jesus. But can I share with you that now, 20 plus years after that conversation, I say to you, the yoke of Jesus is easy and his burden really is light. It's the other yokes it's the other authorities, it's the other expectations, it's the other exacting presences of life that drain us. Jesus is not like that. That's not who he is. He is gentle and humble in heart. And in him, there is rest for our souls. We are those who have taken on the yoke of Jesus, his teaching and his way of life. And as we have access to him, we learn in the context, we learn in the context of gentleness and humility. Living his way is the most fulfilling way. He isn't exacting, and he's not after just diminishing life out of us. He isn't cruel. He doesn't exploit us. As we experience him, who he really is, we then get to offer who he really is to those who engage in life with us. And in this angry time, in this cruel time, in this exacting time, in this polarized time, in this anything but humble time, let us be those who learn of the gentleness and humility of Jesus so that can find its way again into the world, into the earth. Oh God, lead us in the way of Jesus. Last week we introduced the blessing challenge, or should I say two weeks ago, I continued the blessing challenge last week, and it's just simply as this. It's a very simple challenge. To bless three people this week, at least one of whom is not a member of our church, I just want to keep this in front of you. How are you doing with the blessing challenge? Who are you blessing and how are you blessing them? There are many, many ways to manifest the relational presence of God with us and from that extend blessing unto another. How are we doing that? May the Lord quicken your heart to creative ideas. May he open your eyes to see others that in this moment you would be somebody who understands that you have been blessed to be a blessing. Let's pray. Dear Abba, our, our Papa, as the term Abba means, our, our beloved Father in heaven. We are your sons and daughters. You have made us such through your son, Jesus, adopted into your family. And therefore, Lord, we take who we are and we come boldly before your throne of grace that we could receive mercy in our time of need, that we could receive of your relational presence, that we could receive of your resources. Because, Lord, we acknowledge that we ourselves need you. We need you. We need your presence. Lord, what we chiefly need in this one, we need your joy and your peace. These are yours. You possess them, Jesus. And your word says that you give these to us. So our joy is your joy. Our peace is your peace. God, we, we need you. We need the blessing of your joy and peace. But Lord, we pray that as we receive of this, as you inevitably answer our heart's cry, you hear us and you respond. As you give us joy and peace. Now, Lord, I ask that joy and peace would go from us to others. In the name of Jesus, may we be conduits of blessing this week. So, Lord, how can we bless Help us, help us, help us. Oh, Holy Spirit, be poured out on your people. Bring renewal and reviving in the midst of your people. 
and accomplish something great in the earth in this hour of life. Our trust is in you, Jesus. Our eyes are fixed on you. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for joining us here at MC4 at home. Care for you greatly. May the purposes of God prevail in your life and through you even into the world. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. We'll see you soon.